Uh, it's nice to uh, be back with you after not being back last week. And um, I think we uh, are in for a treat because this is obviously a, a very interesting film that uh, provides a lot of fodder for discussion. And I think Jacob's introduction did uh, an especially good job of introducing us or reminding us, uh, introducing us to or reminding us of so many of the great things that there are to think about in this film and why it is such a landmark even now so many decades later. Uh, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, as you can see on your screen, uh, please keep your audio on mute unless you are asking a question or making a comment. Uh, you will know that it is your turn to ask a question or make a comment because I will call on you. And if I, uh, if you might be wondering how I know to call on you, it is because you will use the raise hand function uh, on the great graphic on your screen created by uh, my colleague, Heather. You can see the number two below there and raise hand. If you raise your hand, um, I will know that you have a question to ask or comment to make. Uh, you can also introduce yourself in the chat window. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can introduce yourself to the group. You can ask other participants, uh, of which we have many tonight, what they uh, think. And it's a great place, especially if you're from outside of our area, to say hello and say where you're from. Um, and we would love those of you who are from somewhere outside of the greater Philadelphia area to please visit the Where in the World uh, page on, on the Film Studies Online section of our website, grinmarfilm.org, and let us know where you're from and, and what you think of tonight's discussion or other BMFI programs you've participated in. And uh, I'll tell you about some other programs we have coming up at the end of the discussion, but for now, uh, I think we can get started. And as has been customary uh, for most of the months we've been doing this, um, David is up first. David, good evening. What question or comment do you have? Well, I have one quick observation that was a surprise to me, and then I have two comments. The surprise was that halfway through the film, I started seeing young Paul Newman in Marlon Brando, and you can decide if you want to come back to that or not. My, my two comments uh, tonight, one is about the lighting, and there were certain scenes that they, they got so dramatic and, and creative for, for the early 50s. The, the scene in the factory where uh, Marlon Brando's character is looks like he's dressed in white almost when all the factory workers are in the, in the gray, and as he walks away from that center toward the end of that little scene, he turns gray again. And there were, I think there were probably a half a dozen of these interesting uh, lighting scenes. Uh, I'd like you, the two of you to just comment. And my observation, although I don't think it was part of the introduction per se, is that I was viewing this as a, an early discussion of female post-traumatic stress syndrome. And uh, love to have you uh, chat and decide whether you think I'm off the wall or yep, you, you caught something and food for your thought. And thank you again for a, an interesting uh, selection, something that I unfortunately had never seen before and now have. Well, David, that's wonderful that uh, you've gotten to see this film uh, and you hadn't had an occasion to before because it really is um, a landmark in uh, American cinema. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, many of which uh, Jacob alluded to in his um, in his discussion or in his introduction, um, a few things that you said that I will comment on, and then I'll let let Jacob um, share some of his knowledge on the points um, regarding the the post traumatic stress. Um, I'm I, I think there's obviously something to that. The, the film makes it very clear that um, Blanche underwent a particular um, horrific uh, uh, event uh, toward the end of the film. Um, what I will say though is that I think that Blanche was already um, you know a bit out of balance or out of sorts uh, to start with um, but it seems pretty clear from the film that um, that 
uh, Stanley's assault on her uh, really sort of pushed her over the edge, um, sort of permanently, it would seem. Um, regarding the Paul Newman thing, it's interesting because um, I think that the similarity between these these two actors of, of basically the same generation who, you know, sort of came up um, in the same sort in New York theater and, and in, you know, certainly were students of, of method and employers of method acting. Um, I can certainly see that there, of course, Paul Newman's famous um, Tennessee Williams uh, sort of uh, effort was a cat in a hot tin roof. And, and I think that when people watch that, they might've said, you know, I see a lot of young Brando in this Paul Newman performance. I think it sort of depends on which one you're more familiar with and which one you see first. But I, I think that there's certainly an, an un, there are reasons for those similarities. Um, and uh, uh, as again, as Jacob mentioned in his introduction, so instead of my referencing what Jacob said, why don't we just hear what Jacob has to say? Jacob. Thoughts on David's many points? Sure, I, I'll speak to, uh, I'll speak first to the issue of um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think all of these are well-observed uh, uh, items, David. Um, so I think to me, um, I think it is uh, safe to read Blanche as somebody who arrives as somebody who is already experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you know, one of the things that we understand about um, the experience of trauma, and Blanche has certainly gone through many uh, before the film begins, um, is that people sort of get stuck it, in a time in the past in this sort of moment of trauma, and it sort of reverberates, and they kind of keep coming back to that, and they can't totally separate themselves and move on from it. And we see this happen to Blanche throughout the film. Um, and some of the ways that uh, we can see that happening uh, I would say are kind of wound around, I think, what is the particular like traumatic trigger for Blanche, which seems to be this episode with her husband and the Moon Lake Casino and his suicide that she feels responsible for. You know, and we see her at various times, um, starting really from quite early in the in the movie, hearing the music, you know, that becomes associated with the casino, this sort of uh, polka. Um, this polka music and um, I, you know, um, hearing the shot. And so, you know, we have the sense that there's always this part of Blanche that is, uh, that is kind of living in this, in this moment, you know, uh, is, that's living in this trauma, and, you know, and that helps us understand, um, you know, and, and uh, underscores how she carries that and how that sort of endures in her experience. Um, and uh, you also spoke about the lighting, and I think this is an interesting point too. Um, one of it, it, this is uh, reasonably early in Kazan's um, film career, um, and one of the critiques that was lobbed at him, particularly in this early career, was that he was not a very cinematic filmmaker; that he, you know, was a very stagey filmmaker. Um, but I, I feel like, uh, you know, the, the way that light is used in, in streetcar is, you know, a, a strong argument to the contrary. You know, there's a particularly this really dramatic use of light and darkness um, that we see in characters going into the light and out of the darkness. And that sort of dovetails with the sort of metaphors of light and darkness that we see throughout the film. You know, Blanche wanting to live in a fantasy versus um, or preferring illusion to, you know, the sort of stark light of reality. Um, we see smoke often and uh, steam and mist, you know, around Blanche, um, especially when she's sort of going into a sort of um, reverie about the past or, or sort of one of her um, recollections or one of her riffs. Um, and that, you know, I think sort of underscores this sort of hazy, illusory, you know, world that she um, uh, escapes to um, or attempts to, you know, root herself in. So, I mean, I think it's, um, and, it, and it's visually striking too. So I think, uh, you know, to me, the, the lighting is, you know, a really effective tool and, and, and a really um, uh, is used to, uh, uh, you know, powerful purposes by, by Kazan. I don't recall the name of the film, uh, the cinematographer. Do you, Andrew? I think it was uh, Harry Stradling, who mm. was um, an old uh, Hollywood hand and who I think, I think shot, or I shouldn't say shot, was one of the cinematographers on Gone with the Wind, I believe. 
Um, oh, did you have anything on any of the other thoughts? No, I, I think I think okay. some of these things we'll come back to over the course yeah, of our discussion. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Robert, you have a question or comment. Oh, thanks. Yes, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to um, talk about the cinematography. I did notice that um, Streetcar was nominated for twelve Academy Awards, I, I believe, and. Um, it, it got one of the things it was um, nominated for was cinematography. So I was wondering if we could talk about that. Why is the cinematography so terrific in this film? Now you've touched on the lighting, which I thought was very striking. And I saw that. I also noticed that we're as, as a, as we heard in our introduction, this was um, a film in a confined space and um, the director wanted it in a confined space. And it sort of reminded me of 12 Angry Men where we're filming in a very confined space, we're indoors. And so you're focusing on people's conversations. So, you know, the, it seems like the options for the cinematographer in, the, in this kind of co co confined situation are much more limited. So, I guess we're talking in the cinematography, we're talking about you have people talking basically. And you know, how are you going to approach that? Are you going to do it from what angle are you going to use? And um, are you going to be up or down or just parallel to them? Um, are you going to film uh, both people talking to the Robert? To each other? Robert? Or, anyway, Robert. yeah. We, we, we understand the, some, some of the options available and we understand you'd like some, some more elucidation on the cinematography. Is, okay, is that about? thank you. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Um, I have some thoughts. Uh, do you want me to go first, Jacob? Or would yeah, you like? why, don't, why don't you start it off, Andrew, and I'll, okay. I'll, I'll pick up. Um, I, I, think that, um, I, I think that Robert's assumption is an extremely common one, an extremely common one. In fact, I would, I, I hesitate to even assumption doesn't seem like the right word. I think everybody um, are, sort of presumes that something shot indoors based on a play um, automatically limits uh, and does not present any opportunity for anything interesting um, to be done by the cinematography. And that's actually not the case. It's a very different type of cinematography than you would have, you know, in a, in a Western or something so shot on some other wide variety of, of visually stunning locations, but um, cinematographers that, that I've known um, and have seen interviews with don't really view things that way. They view their responsibility as creating the look of the film that is appropriate for the story and appropriate for the director's vision of how he or she wants to tell the story. And, you know, shooting the Grand Canyon presents one set of challenges and shooting in a small set on the Warner Brothers lot um, creates another set of challenges, but they're all challenges that cinemato a cinematographer would relish and would be um, e eager to take on. I, I think one of the reasons why, uh, the other thing I should say is questions about sort of angle, uh, camera angle, you know, uh, uh, um, a high shot or a low shot or a shot framing two people versus one person, those wouldn't typically be made by the cinematographer, certainly not in isolation. Um, the specifics of how high the high angle is, how low the low angle is, how fast the tracking is, et cetera, et cetera, would probably be the domain of the cinematographer, but whether to shoot things that way at all um, would be heavily influenced by, if not dictated by the director. I'll give you an example in this film when, and here, here's an example I think where cinematography um, is very important in its combination with performance. When, you know, when Marlon Brando, when Stanley hits Stella and she goes upstairs and, you know, he does that famous, right? Um, we see her response to him, her, how she's drawn to him and how she goes to him. And that is, that is, and that is, it is magnetic and you can't look away and you know just what that character is thinking and what the lure is for her to return. 
Now, part of that is obviously um, Kim Hunter's performance, but part of it is how the camera follows her, how close the camera is to her when she first appears at the top of the steps and how the camera, you know, frames her as she descends the steps and then how the camera frames the two of them once she reaches Brando. And there's a great example of something that seems relatively straightforward and doesn't seem like there's a, there are a tremendous amount of options to. And, and I guess in the grand scheme of all the possible things a cinematographer could be asked to do, there aren't a ton of options, but executing that in a way that we know what she is thinking and what she is feeling. And just as she can't stop going down those steps or doesn't want to, we can't look away or don't want to that's part of the function of the cinematographer. The other thing I would say is um, this is to me for the era, one of the most convincing um, uh, non-location shoots that I've seen. Um, they, they were not in New Orleans. They, they, they built a set, those things were sets. Um, and, but they are very, very convincing sets in large part because of the use of shadow and the use of light and the, um, the way the sets are shot and the angles from which the sets have shot. All our sets are shot. All of those things are at least in part a function of the cinematography. And my guess is at least part of the praise the film got for its cinematography would have had to do with just how convincing the sets were made to look. The production designer certainly deserves some of the credit, but um, as any of us has seen when, uh, if we've ever been in an amusement park and they have to turn all the lights on inside Space Mountain instead of just the lights they're supposed to have on, a lighting has a lot to do with the creation of the illusion as well. Jacob. Sure. So let me, Andrew, you've, you've covered a lot of uh, stuff well. So let me speak to one, one, <laughs> one other um, element. So in my view, what, a, what sort of distinguishes a great cinematographer is when they can create images and a look that sort of harmonizes um, with the themes of the film. So one of the themes that we see um, throughout Streetcar and Desire is in the confrontation between you know, Stanley and Stella and in other ways, um, right? This confrontation between the sort of dreamy, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of fantastic world, sort of glamorized, illusory, uh, uh, enchanted world of, um, of Blanche Dubois and the sort of like um, brute, you know, uh, elemental kind of realism based world of, of Stanley Kowalski. And, you know, in resonance with that, the film's sort of tone um, and the way it's presented sort of like straddles this line to me, at least between like realism and sort of expressionism. You know, there are times where we feel um, this film concerns itself with, uh, you know, things that are the province of what we might think of as realist films, things like how do these everyday people live, stuff like the concerns of what's it like for three people to be crammed together in a small apartment. But there's all this other, there's this whole psychological element of the film too, which, you know, is um, less rooted in, in that kind of realist narrative. So there's um, moments in the presentation in the filming where I feel like um, uh, the, uh, the sense of place is very visceral. Um, there's a sort of great realist representation. We really understand like the confines of uh, Stella and Stanley's apartment. We understand that it's hot outside. We get a sense of how people are, you know, um, living out there. It looks like a place that we can imagine in real life. But then there's these other moments, especially when Blanche is going into a sort of reverie or is going inwards, um, where the camera takes on, uh, or the uh, you know the cinematographer helps create these um, sort of uh, more expressionistic images um, that sort of signal to us that you know this this character is in a place that isn't totally rooted in you know the material world. She's partly stepping into a world that's psychological. Um, and that's in dreams and that's in memories. Um, and it's represented, you know, as we um, uh, alluded to earlier um, in the expressionistic lighting 
um, the use of mist and smoke and obscuring shadow. Um, we also see um, this sort of soft focus sometimes where the background sort of gets bleary. And so all of these things are tools, um, you know, that the, uh, 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 the, the Kazan and, and the cinematographer use, I think, to really sort of build this dichotomy between this sort of realism and this kind of melodramatic expressionism. Uh, Nancy, you have a question or comment. Yes, hi, can you hear me? If you could speak a bit louder, that would be helpful. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to, if I uh, adjust my volume, I'm afraid I'll lose you. Or can you hear me better now? Yes, go ahead, got please. You, Thank you. So I come from a certain unique position in that I also am an actor and I played Blanche mm -hmm. Dubois. So mm -hmm. I played Amanda in The Glass Menagerie. So I feel like I know Tennessee Williams women pretty well. And, um, and I understand um, how he wrote them. I'm, I'm very familiar with the script. So I guess I wanted to address a few things if you don't mind. First of all, in terms of the ending of the movie, the film rather, versus the script, um, the script was much more ambiguous. There's a, this tenderness at the end where she's crying after Blanche is taken away and, um, and Stanley comforts her and tells her it's going to be okay and nuzzles her. Uh, and you have the sense that she might stay with him. Um, so I kind of like the ambiguity of the ending of the script. Um, as you had indicated in the introduction, Jacob, the, um, the script was had a lot more words. It was much more uh, trimmed down uh, for, for the purposes of the film. Um, so that's one observation. Uh, a few more points, please. One is um, what I see as a similarity in characters between Blanche and Stanley in that they both really have used their sexuality to manipulate the opposite gender. It's obvious when they meet that Blanche is clearly kind of taken aback by his magnetism and he's very sexual with her, but it feels more in a manipulative, although I think they're both manipulative, but in a way that um, is um, controlling and tormenting. And of course, eventually his attack on her, his brutal attack is out of anger and not desire. And so even though Blanche is from this aristocratic family um, and Stanley is obviously um, raw, they, they, they have this in common, this, this uh, the, the, what they've used their attractiveness for in the past. This feels even more obvious to me when Mitch um, discovers what her past has been and she suddenly loses her Southern lilt, her, vo her voice deepens um, and she seems to almost move closer to how we see Stanley um, mm -hmm. as an audience. And then finally, please, if I can make one more quick point, I'm sorry. Um, as we, as many, as we know, probably Tennessee Williams was gay and I've read that he wrote his women autobiographically, usually Southern vulnerable outsiders living in the past and, and they're sympathetic characters um, who are kind of drawn in a very loving way while his male characters typically are chauvinistic and tes testosterone filled brutes. His women are lovingly portrayed um, which probably has to do with um, his projection of what he wanted his life to be and how he was viewed as an outsider. So I'm sorry, I, I touched on a lot of things, but I just had a lot to say. Thank you. Well, no, thank you. Thank you for those, uh, those comments and uh, those, uh, those perspectives, Nancy. I, I will say that it doesn't surprise me in the least that the conclusion of the film or more specifically um, uh, Stella's behavior at the end of the film is more ambiguous in the play. The, the film would have been required to, if the film was going to go so far as to imply in a way that was clear to most, if not all viewers that Stanley raped Blanche, then Stanley has to be punished. And the punishment uh, and that's and I when I say has to, I mean not just by decency, but by the film industry's um, self censorship organ, uh, organ, which Jacob's absolutely right as he said in his intro is 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 being modified and is beginning to wane by this point. But it 
still can't let something like um, a rape go unacknowledged. And so Stella's far less ambiguous, um, you know, determination to, you know, leave Stanley and never go back to him again, um, though I'm personally skeptical, um, the film makes it clear that she is standing by that and that is the punishment he has to have um, for having, having raped Blanche as far as the film is concerned. Um, the other thing I, I wanna say that I think is very interesting about what you said about how both characters use their sexuality. Um, this is a very interesting, if you think of this film that way or, or you watch this film with that in mind, I guess I should say, and, and that's something I have to confess I hadn't thought, really thought of before putting them sort of on the same kind of footing that way. And I guess part of the reason I didn't is that when a woman behaves that way and a man behaves that way, certainly in Hollywood of 1951, they're depicted very differently and the expectations of them are very differently, right? Are very different, right? So she is run out of town and, you know, branded with a scarlet letter for her assertive sexuality. At the same time, she is supposed to control and, and the expectation is she will control herself, right? As a woman, who, she will control herself or ignore or deny her, her, her sexual appetite. Um, on the other hand, then there's Stanley, who the film would have us believe should, um, you know, doesn't need to monitor himself or police himself nearly, nearly as much. And that part of that permissiveness, um, tacit though it may be, comes from the fact that he is a man. And frankly, that he is something of a, of a, low man as as Blanche might think of him. I uh, just saw in the chat that someone mentioned that Mitch sort of goes down that same road um, during his last encounter with Blanche. And, and I, of course he does. He figures he has license to do that because all of the decorum and, and propriety that he, he seemed to genuinely be interested in pursuing um, goes out the window when he learns that she in her past probably didn't exercise the same propriety that he assumed she had. So it's interesting how the double standard is, is on, very much on display in the film. Yeah. Jacob. Um, well, yes, thank you again for, for those perceptive uh, uh, observations. Um, uh, I'll, I'll touch, I'll, I'll follow up on a couple of the things that Andrew started. Um, First off, right, um, we, uh, I, I tend to concur with you, Andrew, uh, in terms of being skeptical about Blanche's, you know, resolve, you know, this is uh, ostensibly, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Stella's resolve at, you know, leaving Stanley at the end, you know, um, this was one of the changes, right, made to the script to give Stanley his due punishment um, for, uh, for being an awful creep. Um, uh, but you know we've seen um, we've seen Stella retreat upstairs before, and you know we've seen how long her resolve lasted there. So I, I, I you know, I think, um, I think, in his way, Kazan was maintaining some of that ambiguity, you know, within the confines of the code. Um, I, as Andrew said, I think your um, observation about the different ways and the similar ways that Stanley and um, Blanche use sexual power. Um, uh, is, a, is a perceptive and interesting one. Um, you know, um, we, the way that, you know, often I think people tend to characterize the two characters is like Blanche is somebody who's always play acting and, you know, her sexuality and her, you know, is like a form of that play acting or her presentation of her sexuality um, in some respects. Whereas Stanley just is this kind of like, you know, elemental, he is what he is, no self-consciousness type of guy. But I think it's like, we have to, I think if we think about it seriously, we have to, you know, acknowledge that Stanley is like uh, performing his, you know, virility and his like, uh, you know, his like sort of form of, you know, sexual power too. I mean, you know, he's constantly slamming stuff and breaking stuff and, you know, it's like, uh, you know, so exaggerated that, you know, one has to take something kind of performative out of it. Um, I also want to note that um, this was something that Williams himself uh, and Kazan too 
um, observed in the characters. Um, in fact, I, I would like to read a passage that I think uh, that I wrote down because I thought it was so interesting. Um, this is from a letter that Tennessee Williams wrote to Elia Kazan when they were um, sort of getting ready to do the Broadway version. And Kazan um, seized on this particular passage of this letter. He called this the key to the play. Um, I will also say that uh, I have mixed feelings about this characterization, but I'll tell you what the playwright said. Uh, Williams wrote, um, uh, the characters, you know, uh, Stanley and Blanche, um, have a blindness to what's going on in each other's hearts. Stanley sees Blanche not as a desperate driven creature backed into a last corner to make a desperate last stand, but as a calculating bitch with round heels. Nobody sees anybody truly, uh, but through all the flaws of their egos. It is a thing, misunderstanding, not a person, Stanley, that destroys her in the end. In the end, you should feel if only they had known about each other. So again, um, I have mixed feelings about this characterization, um, but uh, this is, you know, something that Williams uh, wrote in and he clearly saw, you know, if only they had known about each other, you know, he writes. So um, certainly one thing that was in his mind was that there was a similarity between these characters and that in another world, um, maybe they would have been able to recognize each other or sense some commonalities in one another. Um, before we get to our, our next uh, question or comment, I just wanted to mention there's been some talk and question about uh, Oscars uh, surrounding this film. Uh, this film was nominated, uh, as, as Robert mentioned uh, earlier, for something like a dozen. Um, it did not win Best Picture, An American in Paris did. Um, and Brando did not win Best Actor. Humphrey Bogart for The African Queen did. And um, what I'm about to say is, is a point made in Roger Ebert's um, write-up on Streetcar, but I think it's an, a very, very important point um, given the importance of um, method acting, you know, as, as Jacob mentioned in his introduction and, and the impact it's had, you know, still to this day for, for seven odd decades. Um, if you think about Bogart and the African Queen and you think about uh, Brando in Streetcar, um, they're both supposed to be these sort of, you know, rough, you know, grease on their shirt, sweat, on, you know, uh, down their back, um, sort of, you know, unkempt, uh, rough around the edges and maybe more than just the edges, uh, sharp, uncivilized guys. But when you look at Bogart in that movie, he sort of has some of that, but at sort of at the core underneath the sort of the, the costume and some of the mannerisms and the dialogue, there's still sort of this civilized, you know, you know, tame man there. And that center, that chewy center is nowhere to be found in Brando's performance of Streetcar and I in Streetcar and I think that I think that what you see there and what you see in the fact that I mean everybody likes the African Queen and and Humphrey Bogart does a fine job but if you talk about which is closer to a performance for the ages we would I think most of us would now say it's it's Brando and in, in Streetcar and so I think what you see there is an unfamiliarity or a lack of appreciation with this new mode of performance that is about to upend Hollywood. Um, because I think, I think by today's standards, most of us would say there's no comparison between the performances. Brando's is, is far superior. But in the view of the time, um, Brando's would have seemed um, the more mannered, not him being a character with manners, but a, a more stylized performance, the one detached further away from reality, because if you think about it, um, nobody would or possibly could maintain that edge, that energy, that ferocity throughout the what we learn are the months that Blanche is there and the months during which the, the, the film takes place but he always has that. 
it, it's never gone. And this is one of those interest. This is an interesting example of how we want films to give us, it's like dialogue. We want dialogue to give the impression of real conversation, but the last thing you want in a movie is for dialogue to actually be actual conversation. The same thing can be said of performance. We say we want realism in our performances, but we're, what we really want is a heightened or condensed or, or amplified realism. And so I, I, I think that, I think that the, the fact that Brando doesn't win um, is really instructive marking this film in, in terms of just how much of a turning point it was. Yeah. Can I add one thing to that? Andrew? Sure, sure. Um, I just, you, you, you've brought up a lot of, I think, uh, important stuff about, right, this sort of difference between this sort of paradigm shift that happens in, in acting. Just one other thing that I think is important to mention um, is um, the way that Brando speaks in this film was something like really unusual for the time. You know, um, it is fair in the age that we live in now, it is fairly common and often actors are applauded for modifying their voices, you know, in interesting ways to, to suit the part. Um, but, um, you know, uh, but this was much more uh, uh, rare at the time, you know, the, the, the sort of classical, you know, uh, acting training was based on, um, you know, Shakespeare and Ibsen, you know, uh, people performing that kind of thing where, you know, you were trained to really elocute and really to make the language clear, you know, and so uh, a lot of people were, you know, and even actors who weren't, you know, acting in highbrow stuff like that, I think internal, like some of those standards carried through. With Brando mumbling and, you know, uh, chewing his words and doing the voice that we now, you know, uh, uh, is so iconic that, you know, that it's a, uh, uh, it's like a riff to do it. Um, uh, some people were astonished by that and but some people thought it was preposterous and ridiculous. Um, uh, it was really something different. So that that's another thing that um, uh, that that is quite different. I mean, you you can look at uh, listen to the way that Bogart talks in The African Queen, and listen to the way that Marlon Brando talks in The Streetcar Named Desire, and it's another, I think, point of stark contrast. Uh, Dana, you have a question or comment. Yeah, I want to stay with the acting a bit, of course, because that's my love and my thing. Um, this, this, this is to me one of the finest pieces of art of any kind that we have, really. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of surprised I don't get the sense from the discussion that people are as moved as people, people often are by this piece. The, the intensity of what what um, Brando and Vivian Lee were able to do, um, I think is astonishing. I think that um, Kazan is, is clearly an actor's director. I mean, he just did incredible things to bring out fine things in his performers. Um, and I wanna say some things about Brando that haven't been said. One of the reasons that I think Brando's performance is so iconic it's not because he did such a wonderful job with the brutishness, um, but there was a delicateness about him too that kind of shined through. And that's where he differed from all of the men who performed before him, both on the stage and clearly on the screen. Um, I think Humphrey Bogart was a vestige of what was ready to go by and he deserved an Academy Award for a lot of his acting past. Brando was going into a new place there are a couple of moments in this movie where um, if you look at the script, when the script says, Stella, Stella, that's all the script says, Stella, Stella. It is Brando and probably it's, um, you know, and Kazan with him who create this man who is so devastated by his wife going upstairs and leaving him. That is something so out of character for any man at any kind of time. There's that moment. Um, he really means it. He really means that he loves his wife. And I think that's very important for us to understand because it sets us up for his behavior toward the end. There's one other moment that I want to pull out. It's a tiny little moment and people probably miss it. There's a point toward the end where um, Kim Stanley is standing with her back towards Brando and he pulls an invisible piece of lint from her sweater. And with all the brutishness and the horribleness of this guy who's about to rape 
And on the stage, of course, the rape really happens. Um, her sister, you know that he is so fixated on her that there is a, there's a great combination in him of so many elements. Pitted against a Blanche who's beautifully written, her character is beautifully written. And for those reasons, I just think this is monumental performing, monumental directing of actors. And we're just really, really lucky that even with the censoring and things that were unfortunately changed from the stage play, which break my heart, we do have forever what I think is one of the most amazing pieces of art of all time. Well, thank you, Dana. Um, I think your your point about the the lint um, is one that uh, um, I, I'm not surprised you noticed as as an actor yourself. Um, Ebert also mentions that in his write up, and it immediately makes me think of when I saw it in the film and when I read read his mention of it, and when you mentioned it, makes immediately makes me think of Brando in On the Waterfront uh, when he has his first long yeah his first long exchange. A long scene with Eva Marie Saint and they're in that sort of park and she drops one of her gloves and he picks it up um, and sort of fumbles with it and then he kind of sl slips this like schoolgirl's glove on his hand um, it's it's expanding it's it's expanding the range of the character in a way that was not intended by the um, by the screenwriter um, at least I know in Waterfront it wasn't, um, and it gives some breadth and some nuance, um, and, and it gives the character a range, which, you know, I think in Waterfront makes him more sympathetic, um, and there's a case to be made, I guess, that that's what's happening in Streetcar, but what I tend to think of it of is, think of it as is we see the tenderness he's capable of which makes his brutality and his brutishness to me all the more appalling. Um, but that's perhaps a, a subjective perspective. Uh, Jacob, your thoughts on some of Dana's comments. I mean, Dana, I think your points are dead on. <laughs> Andrew, I think yours are as well. So uh, I instead of just uh, repeating my uh, agreement, I'll share a couple anecdotes you know, and observations to the same end, right? I think one of the things that makes an actor great is that they can find something in the text, in the script, in the character um, that others wouldn't see. And Brando is certainly a master of that. Um, another moment, you know, another just sort of gestural thing. He's great with these gestures um, that, uh, that sticks out to me in Streetcar um, is like, uh, there's a part where he's, I think he and, and then one of his friends are moving Blanche's trunk into the house. And he's like, um, he's talking, but he has something in his mouth. Like he's just like put something in his mouth to carry it, you know? Um, and it's just like, uh, it's this totally human, you know, gesture, but it's something that, you know, it's like an acting decision that I, I think is, is quite unusual and quite original. Um, I read too that, um, you know, Brand, both Brando and Kim Hunter uh, who played uh, Stella were in um, the original Broadway production. And, um, Hunter uh, recalled that, you know, while they were performing that night after night, um, during that scene where uh, uh, Stanley's ripping open Blanche's chest and pulling out her fox furs and all this stuff, um, Hunter remarked that every night he would find a different way to go through it. Every night he would find something new and interesting to do to sort of keep that scene interesting. So, I mean, right, this, is, this was just an actor who was like working at this sort of level of fine detail and fine perception and, you know, character discovery that, that is really something special. So, you know, I say preach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Janice, you have a question or comment. Yes, I do. Um, I'd like to go back to the double standard for a minute. Uh, back in 51, I believe it was 51 when the movie was uh, done, the double standard was really in force, very much in force. And I think that was probably one of the reasons that that one of the reasons that this was acceptable to audiences is that uh, Blanche got her comeuppance, that it would not have been as acceptable because you know, the, the good girl, bad girl um, dichotomy was very much the way it was. 
And the other thing in terms of Stanley's reaction to her, he saw through the pretense and he couldn't stand that she was getting away with it. And that that was the, the whole animosity against her, that she was presenting herself as something different and that she wasn't allowed to be that in those times. And the other thing I wanna comment on is uh, the rape or supposed rape, and I think obviously it, it really was a rape, had nothing to do with lust. It was totally, uh, uh, as you said before, a brute act, but a brute act of control and uh, showing her who he felt she was. And, and that was the way that, that I read that. Uh, thanks, Janice. Yeah, I think that um, I think that the part I think everything you said is true in terms of the source of his contempt for Blanche. I think the other thing, of course, as, as we see when Stella goes upstairs, um, is that he is he's a scared little boy in some sense, right? And I, I don't mean to say that he's really you know, gentle and docile when he puts on the tough guy act, he doesn't do that. But at his core, just as there is at the core of a lot of bullies, um, there is an insecurity. And he says, he identifies his insecurity very early on. He says to Stella, you know, you were on, I saw the picture of that column, just, you know, that columned plantation house. And I took you down off those columns and, you know, you ain't never regretted it and you ain't never, you know, been back since. Um, and here he sees um, in Blanche, uh, and so, on some level, the airs that she puts on that we eventually learn just how far they are from her authentic self, it would seem. Um, he's afraid that that's going to lure Stella back or that the, um, the disdain that that Blanche has for him as a low person um, will kindle or perhaps rekindle some of that in Stella and he will, he will lose her. And um, I think he can think of, in terms of the, the rape, it was about control and it was about power. And as someone said in the chat, he wants to hurt her and he uses his body to do it. Um, I think he also wants to force her to, um, you know, to be with someone so low as she thinks he is. And of course, by doing that, he in a way proves her point um, and, and far more than her point. But um, I, I think that, I think a lot of this has to do with, uh, with class uh, or the perception of class. I don't get in the film, I don't get for a second that Stella has any thought that Stanley is um, beneath her or that she is remembering that she descends from a family that was once would have once been, have been thought to be high above him. I don't get that at all. But just because she doesn't think that or feel that or exhibit that or give any hint of that to Stanley doesn't mean he's not feeling it. And I think he is. Uh, Jacob, did you have any thoughts on that? Sure. I, I'm going to speak to the question of the double standard and sort of the way that Blanche is perceived. And I'd like to kind of tie this into, I think, some of the ways that, you know, the film gets remembered and gets discussed. Um, one of the things that I find a little bit curious, I've been doing a lot of, you know, reading about the film and um, both what people wrote, you know, how people responded to it at the time uh, of its release and how people have responded since. And one of the things that is strikes me is a little bit surprising is that um, people tend to go back and forth. There's a lot of back and forth about whether um, Blanche is like a, you know, a, a pure victim. Um, you know, uh, some, uh, a critic described her as beauty shipwrecked on the rock of the world's vulgarity um, or whether she's like a, a person who receives her comeuppance. Um, and it seems like both, you know, so which is to say um, the ways that Blanche is perceived um, goes, uh, you know, kind of back and forth between um, 
I would say maybe a moralistic point of view that, you know, uh, finds fault and, you know, finds her promiscuity and her, uh, you know, distortions of the truth um, to be, you know, at least have some role in her ultimate fate. And I would think, and I'm more partial to this perspective, like a sort of more understanding point of view that recognizes her as somebody who's suffered and who has merit and who has value. Um, and, you know, curiously, it seems like both Williams and Kazan sort of went back and forth between looking at Blanche in these, in these ways as well. Um, conversely, Stanley, you know, who is, I think, uh, to me, a, a clearly, uh, you know, pretty brutal character, um, you know, often gets described as an anti-hero, uh, which is to me a sort of strange characterization, but I, I've encountered a lot of references to him um, as a, uh, as an anti-hero. So, I mean, I think, I think, <laughs> I think there is a little bit of a double standard there. Um, but, um, uh, but it's interesting to consider sort of those axes in, in the ways that we think about the film now, um, and how we judge those characters. Um, you know, um, one thing in terms of the way, at least the way that sort of thinking about gender, um, and, you know, its representation uh, uh, shows up in this film too, that I think is significant is, um, and I'm moving away from, you know, Blanche and Stanley specifically here, but um, this is a film that also uh, really seriously contemplates female desire. Um, it takes it seriously. Um, it depicts it. It depicts it. Um, you know, both in the activities of its characters, but it also like shows us, I would think, you know, a, it sort of gazes, you know, at, at the male figures in a way that you don't see in a whole lot of films before. And um, so that's, you know, that's, uh, that's an interesting and novel element of the film as well. And I don't think um, it necessarily damns it. Um, something I want to add is, you know, uh, there's been stuff in the chat about, you know, who, which character is worse and who who's who's the victim. I, I I think I think when something like rape enters the picture, there's there's a transgressor who is worse than the than the person who is transgressed against. I think that's a different level of of um of crime and, and pain and, and brutality that aside, you know, Blanche is no saint, right? She, uh, her, her first husband kills himself because she taunted him so mercilessly. She, um, you know, has, um, at least one affair with a student of hers, which, you know, um, is a, is a problem. Um, and when she gets, to their home, um, she's she's really rude and obnoxious, and she sort of starts poking at and needling Stanley right away. Now, again, nothing that she does, you know, in any way excuses what he will do by toward the end of the film. But you know, she's not this sort of you know polite house guest who um, is sort of unexpectedly um, shown hostility. Uh, you know, she's, and, and, you know, and one could say, well, you know, she's had her own traumas and her own, you know, trials, and she's clearly mentally ill, and, and that could be part of it. That's explained some of her behavior, doesn't explain it all, doesn't explain what she did to her first husband and drove him to suicide, doesn't explain the needling when she first gets there, doesn't explain how she is so rude to her sister when she first gets there. So, um, you know, th th there's enough sort of damage and and bad behavior to, to go around, um, I think. Yeah. yeah can I them. can I add to that, Andrew? Yeah. So let yeah, I'd like to so let me fill in some details, some context too that I think could be useful. Um, so um, in in the in the notes that Kazan and Williams wrote, you know, in developing, you know, the play and eventually the film, um, uh, they really endeavored to to make Blanche not a one-dimensional innocent character nor a one-dimensional, you know, uh, whatever, like deceitful character or, or whatever an ungenerous reading would be. Um, 
In fact, one of the edits that was made from an earlier draft um, before the play went, you know, was performed in Broadway was an earlier draft of the play had um, Blanche's affair with, you know, this student. It made it clear that there was some sort of blackmail situation where the student had discovered something and that was a sort of mitigating factor in, in how that came about. And they took that out because they wanted to retain that sort of moral ambiguity of Blanche. Um, Kazan also wrote that he wanted at the beginning of the film Blanche to come off as he called her a heavy. You know, and we see her do some obnoxious things straight off the bat. You know, she criticizes her sister. She like kind of condescends her sister in some really backhanded ways, you know, initially and teases her about her weight and, and all this stuff. Um, but Kazan, you know, wrote that he wanted her to, uh, right, come off as, you know, the, the heavy, as a sort of unsympathetic character initially, but that over the course of the film, we would come to understand that this was actually somebody who was essentially a good person, who had worth, who had dignity, you know, who, who had something to offer. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is an interesting piece of context uh, that might be lost if you've only seen the film is, um, one of the changes that was made as the film, you know, was adjusted to meet the censorship, uh, you know, requirements was that in the play, it is quite explicit that um, uh, Blanche's former husband was gay and that um, she had, and the sort of circumstances around his death were that she had walked in on him in an encounter with another man and on the, um, and then immediately after they had gone, you know, to this casino and she had made her comments on the floor. Um, so the sort of explicit mention of homosexuality was one of, I guess, the compromises that was made to the script. So I don't have a, a, a more to add on that point, but it's, um, uh, but it's a piece that is in the play that's not in the film and I wanted to fill in that context. Thank you. Lee, you have a question or comment. Okay, um, Barbara, you have a question or comment. Uh, Arlene, you have a question or comment. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, uh, Arlene, go ahead, yeah. please. And uh, whether uh, that was something that also wasn't so good that she had perhaps been involved in as far as her spending. It also said that she took care of family while her sister didn't. So uh, uh, there were some things in the past that were never resolved and perhaps we're not so good that Blanche was involved in. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 enough uh, questionable behavior to to go around with with most of the characters. Um, it's interesting to think that not interesting to think, but it would seem that that Stella is is the best of the lot. Um, Jacob, I, I I don't know. I guess I would qualify that, and I believe what Ar Arlene forgive me if I'm misinterpreting you, but, um, you know, there's a reference um, to Blanche basically staying and kind of holding down the, uh, the fort as it were, as her sort of dissolute family basically, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, ruins their estate um, and everybody, you know, there slowly dies and the whole place sort of goes into the dirt. And it sounds like that was a, um, uh, it sounds like that was an extremely difficult experience. I mean, I think she says at one point, you know, you only came back for funerals, you know, funerals are easy compared to living, you know, and, um, and, you know, we see the sort of, uh, we see her produce these sort of just like reams and reams of paper, legal documents, like from her trunk. So, I mean, I think that's like one of the, I, I don't know, I, I suppose I would qualify that in this sort of traumatic, you know, um, uh, uh, incidents that, uh, that, you know, and, and, and traumatic ordeals that Blanche has gone through that Stella has sort of avoided, um, you know, uh, it, so, so 
that I guess that's how I would I would fill in that that piece of the story. The other thing that was happening also was how this uh, attack on her uh, really killed any possible relationship between her and Mitch, and whether there was any possibility that she could have had a relationship with Mitch if everything in her past was kept secret. <laughs> hmm. Thank you, Arlene. Yeah. Uh, Roseanne and Lex, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, it's Roseanne. Um, this movie was great, and I'm glad you picked it because I saw it many, many years ago when I was young, and my perspective this time was totally different. And so the things I noticed were different. So I have a couple of uh, a question and a comment. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, cinematography. I found it interesting and I don't think I noticed it before um, because I can't get it out of my mind now. The cinematography, when, when they were shooting scenes between the two sisters, when Blanche first shows up, the shooting is normal. But from then on, there's always all these close-ups between the sisters. Sometimes when they're talking, their, their faces are touching. The, the frame, they're, they're framed so closely. So that, you know, that really piqued my interest. And then it piqued my interest that when I, like what was their relationship? Um, you know, they weren't loving sisters, they weren't. But the way the, the cinematographer frames them, he wants me to believe that they're close because he puts them so close. Well, Your if comment. you're, sure. Um, I think that's an, a good observation and an interesting question. Um, one thing I would say in response to that is I think there are times, particularly when they come back from their night out, uh, their big night out and the card game still going on, where there is a bit of a sort of, you know, you know, a bit of sisterly conspiring going on that, that, that they perhaps have become closer over the course of that night of being out than they had been in some time. And whether that's the case or not, they felt that way or they seemed that way or the film wants us to think that. The other thing I would say is it was those two women against all those men out, those drunk men outside playing cards. And so that would foster a closeness, at least a situational closeness, if not a sort of genuine sibling closeness. Jacob, your thoughts? Yeah, um, th thank you for this comment. Right, so I think, you know, I think this is another example of just how rich and, and brilliant uh, and full um, Williams' uh, and Kazan's characterizations are. Um, this is not a one-dimensional relationship between them. There are clearly hostilities between each of them, you know, uh, Stella, um, uh, or uh, Blanche clearly resents Stella for leaving her at Belle Reve. Um, uh, she clearly looks down on um, uh, Stella's life choices in taking up with Stanley, somebody who's quote unquote common. Um, for her part, Stella clearly, you know, I think has hostility to Blanche who's kind of mean to her. And, you know, also here's um, Stella who's made a life for herself as an adult woman and Blanche comes in and kind of treats her like a little kid, you know, and makes her wait on her and stuff like that. Um, by the same token, there is a closeness between them. There's a true intimacy between them. Um, you know, that as, you know, and Andrew mentioned a couple of the instances where we see that. Another thing that is worth, um, I think, bringing to bear is that one of the reasons I would, I would propose that um, Stanley uh, is so hostile to Blanche um, is that he has the perception that she's going to turn Stella against him, you know, um, uh, uh, that she's going to, um, uh, you know, make, make Stella see him in a different way that, 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 uh, you know, he says, he says at a certain point to Stella, you know, we had a, we had a good thing going on here uh, before she came, you know, and, uh, and he has the, the sense that, um, that Blanche is going to spoil that. And there's reason to believe, I'm not too sympathetic to Stanley and, you know, in this uh, film in general, but there's reason to believe there's basis for that. You know, she does uh, talk ill of him. She does turn her sister against uh, him or, or, or make attempts. Um, and so, you know, the film 
one of the sort of dynamics in the film uh, and the play is this sort of tug of war over Stella between Blanche and Stanley. And, you know, uh, the way that um, uh, Kazan uh, shows the sort of physical intimacy between and the physical contact between, you know, Stella and those other two characters are sort of figures into that. Thanks, Jacob. Um, Elizabeth, do you have a question or comment? There, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I would like to share two things, please. Um, my mom was at Yale Drama School from 47 to 48, and she's no longer living, but for the rest of her life, she remembered seeing the New Haven tryout of Streetcar. And she remembered seeing Brando on stage. And she said she simply couldn't take her eyes off of him. So that that presence, which I think comes across very clearly in the movie, um, was was a, apparently even more powerful on stage. So I was watching it the other day to get ready for this, having not seen the movie in a long, long time. And I was really struck by this very contemporary God help us, contemporary combination of sex and violence and desire and class. We're talking, we're talking 60 years ago, or maybe more, 70, whatever the arithmetic is. This thing is hot. And I mean that in terms of everybody's got something going on that is uh, you know, there, there's no demurity, there's no demureness in this movie. This is all about people pressing the edges. And, and I was really, as I was watching it, I was really struck by the imagery in both the sets and the costuming, uh, particularly uh, um, Blanche's clothing, all of these uh, very sort of floaty, I guess it was chiffon or something like like mm -hmm. that. Very thin, floaty stuff. And of course, we couldn't see the colors of it, but they looked to be light colored. And all the breaking of stuff, you know, all the china that hits the walls, glasses that get broken, all this stuff. And I thought how powerful it was, those images of breaking and tearing of fabric and of objects. I, I was just amazed by this being able to be made, and I did do the arithmetic now, close to, you know, pretty close to 70 years ago. This is this is hot topical stuff now. And and uh, there have been some comments in the chats about uh, uh, about the Me Too movement and uh, and Ilya Kazan's uh, you know well documented behavior as a casting coach kind of guy, casting couch kind of guy, uh, and to me that plays into it. Williams is the author, but Kazan has some sort of sympathy for this kind of sexual manipulation between people. Well, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. You, you gave a, a lot uh, for us to think about. Um, I, I will say that um, I think w whether Kazan personally has sympathy um, for this sort of sexual manipulation or the sort of behavior Stanley ultimately exhibits, um, whether he does or not, um, it is his job as the director of this film to have it for the purposes of this film, just as it is Tennessee Williams' job to be able to access that mentality enough to write those characters. And um, I, th I, I, th I think both do that. And that's part of the reason why both of them created a number of works that are being, you know, not just experienced, but discussed and revisited, you know, more than seven decades later in some cases. Um, I also would say that, um, you know, Dana said earlier that, that Kazan is an, is an actor's director and he, he really did know how to get tremendous performances out of people. Um, I think it is not a guarantee that the magnetism that someone like Brando exhibits on stage is going to come through in a motion picture. I think part of that has to do 
there's a lot of elements to that. There's Kazan's direction. There's um, the costumes, which were nominated for an Oscar. There's the set and there's the cinematography making those people stand out in that background just enough to be noticed and to be the center of attention, but not so much that it seems like there's some unexplained spotlight on them. Um, the, so, so, so there's, there, there are a lot of, a lot of factors uh, that go into that. Jacob. You've made a lot of great points here, Elizabeth. Let me try to touch on a couple of them. Um, first of all, an interesting fact, um, before Streetcar opened on Broadway proper in New York, in I think it was late November, early December, 1947. It played in two places outside of, uh, of New York. The first was New Haven. The second was at our own Walnut Street Theater here in Philadelphia. So there's an interesting fact for you. Um, I also want to um, uh, concur with your observations about the costuming. Um, I spoke in my uh, introduction a little bit about um, the, uh, the clothes that Brando wore as a sort of recognition of a new kind of um, male fashion that was, uh, that was you know, becoming popular in the United States in the post-war period. But as you say, Blanche's uh, costumes are significant too, right? Um, there was specific uh, notes um, uh, by Kazan uh, that uh, Blanche should wear chiffon or organdy, um, these sort of really light, you know, airy clothing. And he described her as like a moth you know, and, and we see that, you know, uh, conveyed in the, uh, in the costuming. Um, finally, about the sort of modernity of the film um, and, the, uh, uh, and, and some of that having to do with the film's treatment of sex and sexuality and sexual power. You know, this was one of the innovations of the film um, uh, in, in one of the sort of significant, um, uh, 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 you know, impacts of it in terms of uh, clearing the way for more films dealing with this kind of content matter. Um, you know, this was a period in time where culture was changing. It was a post-war period. It was a more worldly period. Um, the, uh, uh, the sociologist, um, or I don't, I don't know if he's a sociologist, but Alfred Kinsey, the, uh, you know, who famously documented human sexual uh, behavior was starting to publish his reports around this period. And this is a film that takes an interest in a serious consideration of the sexual behaviors of its characters um, and uh, not only acknowledges that they happen, but makes us think about them because uh, their sexual behaviors and their sexual predilections and their sexual pathologies uh, are important to um, understanding the, the reasons that they act in the ways that they do. I alluded to this in my, uh, in my introduction, but I, I think that's an important um, uh, you know, thing to emphasize. And um, this would sort of uh, open the doors, not just for um, more, uh, you know, mature themed uh, films coming out of Hollywood, but it also sort of preceded an influx of, you know, films from Europe and other places that were, you know, starting to deal with, uh, with these themes too, um, and, and, and played a role, I would think, in priming American audiences to engage with that stuff. In a, in a cinematic fashion. So uh, thank you for your comments, Elizabeth. Uh, Barbara, are you there for, Barbara Casper, are you there for your question or comment? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah, I just, so many great comments, but I wanted to get back to what Dana said that, um, you know, it's obviously a masterpiece movie the acting's unbelievable. Um, so definitely, you know, the fact that we can enjoy it so much later and a lot of the contemporary, you know, seems very contemporary in some ways, but just wanted to put, you know, definitely one of my favorite movies and appreciate all the great comments tonight. Well, thanks very much, Barbara. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Uh, Lee, uh, do you have a question or comment? Okay, then we will end. No, no. Oh, you're there. Go yeah. ahead. I, I just, I'd seen the movie a long time ago. And this time I was uh, sort of blown away by the versatility, subtlety, and power of um, the way Blanche was played. Uh, uh, Brando's dynamism was clear before, but uh, she did an absolutely fantastic job of portraying uh, terrible um, 
mental suffering and and uh, uh, striving and and uh, uh, a kind of amorality from her uh, narcissism and her her um, at the same time she's both pathetic and and uh, in some in certain ways appealing so uh, it was just an incredible uh, performance. Thank you, Lee. It was. Um, some people have asked why uh, Jessica Tandy, who was on Broadway with Brando and many of the others in the film, uh, wasn't in the film. And uh, the answer is that Vivian Lee was playing Blanche in London and Vivian Lee was a much, much bigger star. And remember, at this point, Brando is not tested in any way as a leading man or as a movie star. Uh, so, in fact, if you watched the credits of the film, you saw that Vivian Lee's name was not only listed first above Brando's, it was also in a larger font. So that tells you something about the, the star power she brought um, in terms of the industry's view of things. Uh, our last uh, comment or question for the night comes from Kenneth. Kenneth, are you there? Yes. Uh, just a quick one, and maybe I missed this, but... Uh... Jacob, I enjoyed your introduction to the movie. I thought it was uh, really helped uh, enhance things. Um, what was the alternate ending that was talked about? Has this been mentioned? Uh, it has. Jacob, do you want to reiterate it? Sure. So um, in the uh, original, um, in, in the play, uh, the ending has um, uh, Stella, you know, having come home with her child, basically, you know, seeing, uh, seeing Blanche off and then, you know, returning to um, life with Stanley. Um, the censorship codes that, um, you know, uh, Kazan was uh, uh, obligated to, uh, you know, to adhere to um, required that a character who is criminal or who does wrong must, you know, face consequences for their actions. And so the way that, you um, uh, you know, must be punished for their actions. And so the way that, um, uh, you know, Kazan uh, chose to do that was by having um, Blanche ostensibly leave Stanley with her baby. You know, she says, I'm never going back there again. I'm never going back there again. And she takes her baby uh, and goes upstairs to Eunice's apartment. Um, but uh, as, uh, as Andrew mentioned before, I think, you know, based on what we've seen, um, in the uh, in the film beforehand, we have uh, I think ample reason to wonder how long that resolution will stand. Um, I see that that Dana and Robert have other comments, but but we are way over. And since we we got to hear from you all earlier on, I, I think we're going to have to um, to leave it here. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the wonderful comments, perspectives, questions on uh, a film that obviously was was is still very, very much um, worth viewing and reviewing and discussing. Uh, we have some upcoming seminars, our Tuesday night seminar series. Uh, we have one tomorrow night with the wonderful Jennifer Flieger uh, that introduces us to the trailblazing uh, woman director, Dorothy Arzner, who was uh, worked in uh, the studio system's earliest years and was a trailblazing woman for that reason. Uh, and then I will be giving a seminar on the films uh, from this era, uh, the post-World War II era in America, uh, later in October. We have some more uh, seminars that we'll be, we will be announcing soon, uh, so please stay tuned for those. Of course, um, we will be here most Monday nights uh, for another free film discussion. We hope you all can join us and you will tell your friends from uh, around the area and around the country. Um, if you want to know what films we will be discussing on Monday and uh, get a link to the video introduction and, and to register for the discussion, sign up for our emails. It's announced in our Thursday email. We send uh, emails every week uh, updating you on all of the goings on. Uh, at BMFI uh, as we are currently online, whether it's the Film Studies Online or Theater 5, where uh, we have so many wonderful new films that you can only see there and lots of other things going on. So um, please visit BrynMarFilm.org, check out the Film Studies Online section, check out Theater 5. And if you like what we're doing uh, and you have the means, uh, we would uh, very much appreciate you offering uh, 
uh, to make a contribution to BMFI. Um, we can use the support until we are able to reopen and until there are great movies we can show that lots of people want to come see. Um, we are uh, always appreciative of everybody's support as we are appreciative of your, of your participation in events like this one tonight. And I will say that I am particularly appreciative of Jacob for joining me and for his wonderful introduction. Uh, Jacob, thanks so much. Um, we look forward to our next discussion with you and we look forward to seeing you all for another discussion uh, next week. So until then, thanks very much and have a good night. Farewell, folks.